Ready? Okay. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The uh, Parks Committee meeting for September 30th is now in session. Let it be noted that all the Alders, Alder Garlock, Alder Brunette, Alder Weary, and the Chair, Alder Scannell, are present. I'll take a motion to uh, approve our agenda. So moved. Thank you. Moved by uh, Alder Brunette, seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have an agenda. A motion to approve our minutes from our last meeting. Move to approve. Second. Moved by uh, Alder Brunette, seconded by Alder Gerlach. Uh, any problems with the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we, our minutes have been approved from last time. Uh, are we ready for regular business? Ready to go. There you go, okay. Consideration with possible action on the request by Alder Brunette on installing security cameras at all three city swimming pools. Staff. Yeah, so we reached out to the police department and the IT department in regards to this request. Uh, they typically do all of the coordination and installation of the cameras throughout the city. And there are currently cameras already installed at Joanne's and Rush Aquatic Center. They've been there for a number of years. And we did verify that they are in working order. Uh, the only pool that did not have a camera, unfortunately, was Colburn Pool. Uh, so the police department and the IT department uh, did go out to Colburn Pool uh, to begin their research on what's involved with installing a camera there and what the cost would be. Uh, at this point, we don't have any additional information to provide, but our plan moving forward is to install a camera at Colburn Pool to be consistent with the other pools. Uh, if for some reason it's cost prohibitive, prohibitive uh, we can bring this request back to the Park Committee for further discussion. Um, so that's about all I have to report on it at this point. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions moving forward. Alder Brunette. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. I <clears throat> brought this mo uh, communication forward, as many of you are aware, I'm sure probably all of you are aware. Uh, fortunately, we had a, a death at Colburn Park a few months back, and God rest his soul. And I don't know if cameras could have prevented the death, uh, but after hours, um, I don't know, Director Ditscha, if you can confirm this, not uh, I'm sure this is actually happening, but. I've been told throughout the community, having lived in that area, that people go to Colburn Park after hours, whether for recreational in this situation, it turned tragic. Uh, so I know I mentioned security cameras, but it was more, more than just that. Could we have motion detectors or some sort of enhanced security so that if there are people using Colburn Park after hours or the other aquatic centers, could we have some sort of alarm that the police can go investigate? I'd hate to have a tragedy like this happen. This was apparently incidental. It was a on purpose situation, but I want to prevent accidental drownings as well. And so uh, there's no rush in this. Obviously the pools are closed for the year. So with that, any other you know, input you have to that director did shite? Uh, aside from those comments, I'd be fine with referring back to staff for more information. Yeah, at this point, I don't have anything to add in regards to that. When I talked to IT and the police department, it was strictly in regards to the cameras to be consistent with our other pools. Um, but we can definitely uh, look into that, and I can get you more information on that as far as what our options would be. Okay, I'll make a motion to refer to staff. Is there a okay. second? Second. Motion by Alder Burnett uh, to refer to staff, seconded by Alder Weary. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. That goes back to staff. Ready? You're muted. You're muted. Right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, at what point did did this uh, did we pass all the, uh, the first one? Then that I, was, I don't know how I hit the mute. All right, anyway, on to item two. 
Um, oh, for God's sake, now I lost my whole screen. Uh, consideration with possible action on the request by Alder Galvin to establish a schedule and system to open all park bathrooms by 8 a.m. every day and close them at 8 p.m. every night. Uh, staff? I guess uh, I would like, if possible, I'd like um, uh, Alder Galvin to kind of start this out and, and then we can address his questions as we go. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, years ago, uh, the park every morning and they were closed every night. And uh, currently the policy is they're only open when the uh, staff are there, like for the parkies with the programs in the summertime or when someone rents a shelter. Um, it just seems to me that uh, we have beautiful parks. We encourage people to get out and use those parks, uh, walk their dogs, uh, sports. I mean, you name it, just go for nice walks in the fall weather. And those bathrooms are there, the water is running, but the doors are locked and no one can use them. And uh, I was recently just up uh, north biking with my wife uh, we started the trailhead at one park, ended at another park miles away, and both bathrooms and both those communities were open for the public to use on, on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I've been to other communities where the public restrooms in the parks are open during the daytime. And like I said before, at one time I was one of those people, um, when I was a cadet for the police department, our job was on the day shift was to open the parks and uh, the shelters, unlock them. and. Uh, check them uh, periodically during the day. And then at night, uh, the next shift, the afternoon shift would lock them up uh, towards sunset. I mean, I, I put in there eight to eight, but I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing numbers out there because obviously there was, uh, you know, with that many parks to close, you're not gonna get them all open at eight and you're not gonna get them all closed at eight. But it just seems to me that we've got all our, our citizens trying to use these parks. We're trying to encourage people to use the parks and you're there with your children. You uh, get to be a gentleman of a certain age like me and suddenly you need to use a restroom and it just doesn't seem practical to get in my car and drive five miles across town to go home or look for a gas station or something like that. We've got these bathrooms. We paid to have them installed. We pay to have the water run through them all summer long until the weather gets too cold. Why not open them up for people to use? Thank you. All right, I guess um, I'll kind of uh, speak to the committee here about uh, uh, the reasons that we don't open all the shelters and kind of what concerns we would have to address if we were to look at opening them, uh, all of them, uh, every single day. And then we can see where the discussion goes. So currently all of our restrooms are closed to the public due to COVID-19 concerns. Uh, for the safety of the public and our staff, uh, we don't intend on going back to our normal restroom opening schedule until the cases in Brown County trend in the right direction. So this, this year, uh, it's been obviously a little more noticeable than other years because we haven't opened any restrooms all year long. Uh, since COVID first hit. Uh, in a normal year, uh, we don't open the restrooms every day of the week, but we do open quite a few of them. So I would estimate we currently open at least half of our park restrooms in the summer months. And in the spring and fall, we open approximately a quarter of the park restrooms. In the winter months, we only open restrooms uh, that have parks with hockey rinks and at Fireman's Park. So on a daily basis, we use the following criteria when we decide which restrooms to open, because it does vary from day to day. So we look at uh, what the schedule activities are uh, in that park. We look at the schedule of athletic events. Uh, we look at uh, which restroom requests have been made uh, by groups such as daycares using the parks, because we'll open up the restrooms if there's a request. Uh, we do open the restrooms for splash pads and wading pools. Uh, those are open. Uh, we do open the restrooms in the summer months uh, for the park playground program. And then we also open the restrooms in the parks that are heavily used. So that's how we go about selecting which shelters we open on a day-to-day -day basis. On the weekends, uh, it's even a little more difficult to open and close shelters than it is uh, during the weekdays because we have limited staff members uh, to assist and we have other events such as other shelter rentals, special events, 
activities on city deck and the Metro boat launch. And the same uh, employees that are locking and unlocking the shelters also have to you know, take out garbage for these special events and these other locations. So the challenge that we have as a, as a city of Green Bay versus other communities is just the vast number of shelters with restrooms we have compared to other communities. Uh, so not including Bay Beach Amusement Park and the Wildlife Sanctuary, there are 36 parks with shelters with restrooms attached. Um, most of our park shelters are winterized because they don't have any heat in the shelter. So even if we were to open them spring, summer, and fall, most of them we would have to shut down in the winter months uh, unless we want to invest some infrastructure in heating the buildings and additional um, insulation around the pipes and, and windows and doors and stuff. Uh, so uh, the big issue with having 36 locations is the amount of time it takes and the amount of staff that we have dedicated to doing this work. So we currently have two full-time caretakers in the morning shift and two full-time caretakers in the evening uh, who are responsible to open shelters, set up the parks, get the shelter rentals ready, clean the restrooms, empty the garbages, and lock the shelters. So we have two in the morning, two in the evening. We split them up between east and west uh, so that there's a little bit of efficiency there. Uh, in the summer months, we do hire two to three seasonal employees in the evenings to assist with closing because we need the additional staff to close uh, the shelters that we have open. And we do that currently with seasonal employees. So just to give you a perspective of how long the process takes, it takes approximately 15 minutes to open each shelter each day, set up the tables and get the shelters ready to go. Uh, in the evening, it takes about 30 minutes to clean the restrooms at the end of each day and lock them up and take out the garbages and then move on to the next shelter. So our night shift works from 2.30 to 10.30 every day. If there's 36 shelters um, that we want to open and close every day, it would take nine to 10 hours per day for those two employees to clean and lock up the shelters on a daily basis. So we would have to pay overtime to those employees all year long in order to just do it. Um, if we were to look into accommodating the request, really the only feasible way that we could do it, and I'm not opposed to doing it, I think it's a great service to the community, but we would have to probably double our staff uh, in order to uh, open and close those on a timely manner. You know, if our two employees started locking up the shelters at 2.30 every day, uh, that kind of defeats the purpose also of opening the shelter. So in the morning shift, uh, I'd assume we would need one to two additional full-time staff. Uh, we could probably get by with one additional staff and we could, instead of hiring a new person, we could look at shifting other job duties of that one employee uh, to open more shelters. Now we have not researched what would fall by the wayside by shifting duties if we didn't wanna hire another person to do it. But it only takes about 15 minutes to open the shelter. So we could probably get by with one new uh, employee. Uh, the challenge is really the evenings because it takes a half an hour to go through each building and lock them up. Uh, so if we were to lock up every building every day, uh, we would probably need two additional full-time staff members. And because those are evening hours, we don't have additional staff on hand uh, that we can change their job duties to do this instead. Uh, so we would have to look at hiring two additional people and we would have four people and that would be their job every day is going around and cleaning the bathrooms, emptying the garbages and locking the buildings. In addition to those two staff members, uh, we would need to add two vehicles to our fleet so that those two people could drive around from shelter to shelter during their shifts uh, with all of the cleaning supplies and you know have a truck to put the garbage in. So uh, we are definitely short, especially in the summer months of vehicles, and we just would not have the vehicles on hand uh, without adding to our fleet. 
Um, so that's the challenges that we have with accommodating this request. It's not that we don't want to, it's just it's very challenging to do it with the staff we have. Uh, so I just wanted to explain a little bit more information about what we do and why we, do, why we don't open all of the buildings currently. So I don't know where you would like the conversation to go from here, but that's uh, what I have to present at this point. Uh oh, Alder Galvin, anything? Sure. Um, and, and again, I'm only drawing on my experience when I actually had to open up bathrooms and close them down for the city. And, and we, in addition, we also turned on and off the tennis court lights and uh, conducted some other uh, services for the park department. Um, and as I recall, uh, in the summertime, we have uh, what they call parkies in the shelters that have children. Is that correct, Dan? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And it would seem to me as part of their duties, they could probably bag the garbage and just put it by the door uh, for whoever comes to lock it up at the end of the day, saving that kind of time. Yeah, that could be done for the parking program, yeah. Right. And I, I don't think they clean the bathrooms every night when they lock up, do they? Uh, the parkies do not. It's our caretakers that so you know. so they clean the bathrooms every night. So I mean, I mean, what are they? I mean, do they clean the bathrooms whether they need it or not, or is that just something they clean it on a rotating basis, or if they look and they see something's going on and they think it needs to be cleaned? Well, uh, they'll take care of the big messes for sure, and then they do have like a rotation where they go around and they don't deep clean every single bathroom every day. Uh, you know, the half an hour is an average. Uh, some bathrooms take longer uh, when you're doing that deep clean and others take less time if there isn't a lot to do. Okay. The half an hour is a rough guesstimate. Right. You know, and I'm not looking for the bathrooms necessarily to be open in the wintertime because I understand with the buildings not being insulated, that would require a lot of heating, keep the pipes from freezing and, and breaking and, and, and the mess that goes along with that. Um, I mean, we used to have ice skating rinks and the shelters there were unlocked and they were manned like with a college student, but I don't think they do that anymore. And I know that uh, the brand spank a new shelter next to by my house, they didn't even put a furnace in it because they couldn't afford it. So there is no heat there to begin with anyway. Um, but I would just think that during the summertime, we could, we could get part-time help. I mean, we have kids like the parkies, they're not making a, a huge wage. Uh, the police department has been kicking around the idea of trying to get a, a, an enhanced uh, um, intern program going, uh, community service officer, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I mean, these are certainly, uh, I, I think we need to think somewhat outside the box other than just it's going to be this many more hours, this many more people, this many more vehicles. I mean, um, I, I like what you're talking about. Let's see if we have current employees that we could redistribute some of their job titles or how they start their day. Um, but uh, I, I think there's solutions here, and I'm just hoping the city can work its way towards uh, having these bathrooms open, at least during the peak times of the year, say the beginning of summer through uh, mid to late fall, like now. Thank you. Uh, Alder Burnett. Yes, thank you, Chairman Scannell. I know we discussed this a few months back and I think we came to the same resolution that Gosh darn it, I think a lot of us agree that it's a good idea, but it comes back to what does it mean and how can we pay for it? I agree with Alder Galvin. Uh, I think if we're all real with ourselves, I think one of the worst things is really having to go to the bathroom and rushing to a park shelter and then realizing the door's locked. I've done that a, a number of times. It's not a very good feeling, especially if that child you're with is the one that has to go to the bathroom. So. Uh, I don't think we need to clean the bathrooms every single day. I do think it's possible we can contract with a cleaning service to, you know, do it weekly or every biweekly. I know, I know that's not ideal, but if the public would have access to restrooms three seasons out of four seasons of the year, I think that that's a fair trade-off. You know, I'd rather use a dirty restroom than not have access to the restroom at all. The question is, are we going to spend money on this uh, to use staff services to do it? I agree with De Director Ditchite. These are tough decisions. And if it's never been budgeted or we never put it in the budget for consideration, then it's kind of a moot point. So, man, th there's got to be a way. We, we can figure something out as a city. I think that the demand, the, 
expectation of the city residents is out there. I think other municipalities do it. Granted, they're not as large as we are. Um, I want to I want to think positively. I don't want to, you know, act out of frustration because I know it's tough, Director Ditchite. But I really look at the contracted service for for restroom cleaning. You know, I don't think we need to use city staff on average a half hour at every restroom daily. Um, that's all I have. I it's tough. I, I know it, but. I agree with Alder Galvin. Hopefully we can find a solution. We did this discussion two or three months ago with the same outcome. Alder, uh, Alder Gerlach and then Alder Dorf. Just two questions, please. First of all, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. No matter what is decided, uh, Director Ditchite, we're not going to be opening the bathrooms during COVID. Is that right? That is the current policy that uh, our COVID policy that we brought up that we presented to the park committee and city council a few months ago. Yes. Right. And, and so that could go on for a long time. Uh, the second question is, and this is a little unrelated, but I just wonder if they dovetail. I remember hearing just a few weeks ago about the need to have bathrooms during COVID because of the homeless people that had no place to use the bathroom because of the restaurants being closed, et cetera. And I just wondered, has that been addressed in a different way or is that um, also part of this concern? I don't know who can answer that. I can answer that. So what we have done uh, to accommodate that issue or to resolve that issue is we put uh, porta potties uh, out at the park uh, for the homeless people to use. Um, again, we, we considered opening the restrooms, but because of COVID concerns, we did not. Okay, thank you. Alder Dorf. Thank you, um, Chair. So I've kind of an out of the box idea, but maybe not so much out of the box. I know that we contract, um, do a contract with a school district every year. I know a lot of parks are adjacent to schools and the school district employs a lot of custodians, first shift, second shift. Some buildings even have third shift custodians. Just thinking about it, even we, if we didn't open all the shelters, but maybe the shelters adjacent to schools and somehow work that into the contract we already have with the school district. Maybe we could get part of it done, you know, by, by using the resources they have that, um, that we don't have at certain hours of the day. And we already have a, a way to negotiate because there is already a contract that exists. So maybe just kind of put that in your memory bank a little bit. Think about that. I'm not thinking we can make a decision on that tonight. We'd have to look at the angles, but that might be a possibility because I don't think cleaning bathrooms every other week is such a good idea. I think you better clean it more often than that. I'm pretty sure you need to. Thanks. I would just like to add that um, I think perhaps if we refer this back to staff and if we could get uh, 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 our director to uh, reach out maybe to the police department and the schools uh, between all three of us, we might be able to come up with some kind of plan that's pretty viable. Um, I mean, if the police department can help out uh, some and the school district can help out some and uh, maybe we'll figure out a way to put all the pieces together and, and uh, not put too much of a burden as far as hiring new or uh, overtime or anything else so we may still need to do a little something but if we uh sat down and tried to put all these pieces together we'd have a we'd know where we stand at least if it's doable and how doable my thoughts anybody else i'll make a motion and, yeah i'll make a motion to refer this to the park department to work with the police department to reach out to the police department the school district and Two months ago, we discussed possibly neighborhood associations. Right. Um, we should include them. So, yeah. uh, motion to refer to staff to work to contact all three of those groups to see if there's interest in in assisting. I'll second that. Okay. Motion by Alder Burnett. Second it by Alder Gerlach. Um, I'll just throw in when I was in Mexico, they they actually had. Uh, people living in a park and they would take care of the park. So maybe a neighborhood association might adopt a park and there's, I don't know what all they could do, but there might be some things they could do. So yeah, I think it's a good, 
a good idea. All right. Uh, any, uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Does that sound uh, pretty doable? Dan? We can look into it. We can look into it some more and come back with a recommendation. All right, thank you. James, are we? Good, good for okay. number three. Consideration with possible action on the request by Alder Galvin to study and develop plans to reopen the East River Trails within city limits on both sides of the East River. <laughs> Did we want to start with Alder Galvin again, or? I think that's a good idea. Alder Galvin, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I was actually uh, contacted by Amanda Chu, the uh, uh, county supervisor uh, for the area that uh, I was originally questioning, and that's over by uh, Ann Sullivan School by Riverside Ballroom. That trail over the last two years has been open maybe about a half to two-thirds of that time. Other than that, it's been uh, underwater, covered with mud, algae, muck. Um, you can see where some bikes have been driving through, but a lot of people have contacted me that they're not able to walk or bike through there anymore. Um, along with that, if you go over just south of Mesa Street, uh, just by Hartung Street, there's another section there of the East River Bike Trail that's been underwater, off and on. It's underwater right now. Um, if you go over to the uh, park system along the west bank of the East River running from Mason Street down to Alloway. Uh, there are several sections there that have been underwater off and on all year. Cattails growing up, mud, algae. There's even a ball diamond that has a, a cattail crop growing in the outfield uh, there and the, that ball diamond's unusable. I'm not going to get into the global warming or not. Our water levels in Lake Michigan are at record high and that dovetails right into what happens on the East and Fox River. And with the, some of the rains we're beginning, I, I don't see this going away anytime soon. So we have these beautiful trails um, that are unusable and they may be unusable for years to come unless we can do something. Um, what we do, there's many different things you can do, but you can't do anything until a study has been completed. And you have to involve the DNR and uh, the Corps of Engineers and I don't know how many other government agencies. But that's when you, with that study, you'll find out what you're able to do. And all I'm advocating is that we um, make the monies necessarily for this to be available for the park department to have that study done. With that study done, we can start looking and Alloway's already told me that they're willing to work with us on some solutions. I'm sure Bellevue and the pier would also be willing to work with us because that trail, if you go all the way down to uh, Ledgeview is out of service all the way down through there. There's uh, so many areas that are underwater. And I think with that study done, we think put it on the shelf and we start looking for financing, state, federal, dollar, on government organizations, uh, philanthropists that are looking to do some good in our, our community. And with those monies then, we know what we have to do, we know what it's gonna cost, and then it makes it easier for us to go out and start looking for those monies and, and see if we can put together a solution and open these trails back up for everybody. I mean, we've got, we're spending the money right now to try and take the Fox River Trail to hook it to the East River Trail. And I mean, it's a long process. It's been years in the making for the Fox River Trail, years in the making for the East River Trail, and then to get that connected. And I think this is part of that process that we have to be looking for solutions to be able to use these, these uh, things that we have in our community. Thank you. So I can add a little bit more information to that. So um, none of these areas, uh, uh, yes, Alderman Galvin is correct. Uh, they have been underwater for the past year or two uh, because what's happening is the water is coming over the stream banks. At those particular locations, the stream banks are fairly low. Uh, so that's kind of the first areas where the floodwaters kind of exceed the banks and go over onto the parkland. And so that's happened regularly over the last couple of years uh, because of the high water uh, elevation. So 
uh, we are not able to keep those particular locations dry. Uh, and it's all due to the high water. Uh, there's nowhere for that water to go uh, because in some situations, the elevation of the trail is roughly the elevation of the stream bank. And so if it goes over there, it's over the bank, it's gonna go over onto the trail. Uh, but when the water level is down, historically, we haven't had these problems along the trails. Uh, but the last two years, we've had quite a few problems. Uh, we've had to build these trails uh, more or less at existing grade when we put them in, because these are all areas that are considered floodway. And you're not able to fill within a floodway uh, without doing a floodway study. Uh, so the purpose of this analysis uh, is to ensure that what you do on the property, uh, if you're gonna raise grade or add vertical elements that might obstruct uh, flood waters, uh, that what you're doing uh, would not have a negative effect downstream, downstream to an adjacent and property owner and flood their property. Uh, so that's the study that Alder Galvin is referring to is it's a floodway study for these particular locations to find a resolution to the problem, which would likely mean either raising the elevation of the trail higher than the stream bank or uh, installing a, a raised boardwalk, uh, which has has some vertical post features which could block the floodway waters if it floods. Uh, so these flood studies are fairly expensive and they take a long time to get uh, approved through the DNR. Uh, so based on um, discussions I've had with our parks engineer, you know, it could cost about $30,000 to do these floodway studies. And I'm not sure how many we would have to do. I don't know if that's 30,000 per location or if it's that's for the whole. Um, but really our only options moving forward to solve this problem are to wait for the water levels to drop again. Uh, when that happens, the trails likely will not be underwater anymore because historically they weren't until the water levels came up. Option two is, like I said, raise the grade and repave the trail at a higher elevation. And option three is to build a boardwalk to get the trail out of the low areas. Uh, we currently, as a parks department, do not have any funding available to complete these floodway studies or repave these sections or build boardwalks. Um, so right now, with our funding situation the way it is, our only option is to wait for the water levels to drop on their own. Uh, if the park committee and city council would like to take a more active approach to, the, to finding a solution to that, I'm all in favor of it. I think it's a great idea. Um, and really the only uh, option would be to search out funding for that. So we've already submitted our CIP to the, to the finance department and our 2021 bond request to the finance department. It hasn't gone to the finance committee yet, but it's been submitted to the department for their review. Um, I did not include uh, any funding in there for these flood studies or money to raise the grades because my intent when I submitted it was to wait for the water levels to drop. Uh, so if it's something that the park committee would like us to be a little more proactive on, uh, what we could do is put together a cost analysis and discuss it uh, at bond request uh, when it goes to the finance committee. Uh, to see if that's something that they wanted that the finance committee and city council would like to add to the bond request. I don't have those dollar amounts right now off the top of my head, but we can research it and have it for uh, that budget meeting if you'd like. Well, thoughts from the committee? Or anyone? Well, it seems like we're gonna, uh, even if we do wanna go forward with this, it seems like we're gonna have to take some time to figure out the financial end of it first. So um, I'm thinking we're gonna have to uh, wait for the next year for budgeting. Uh, unless there's, would there be any kind of grant dollars out there, are you aware of, uh, Dan, that we could try for? Or? Unsure at this point. Um, we could look into it. Um, 
Possibly. Okay. Uh, Alder Brunette. Yeah, I'm not, not that I agree with this, but if you were to take a cynical view, you could say it's a low-lying area next to a river. Nature's doing what nature's intended to do. But then the problem is then people use the trail and should use the trail. It's good active recreation. Question is, raise the trail as Alder Galvin and Director Ditchite said. So question is now, do we want to spend the money on it given all the other priorities throughout the city and all the park areas, uh, but without at least referring to staff to start the process of you know, putting it together in our bond request or sourcing what the cost would be to even do the study. Um, I think that's where we start. Uh, I, I don't want to spend any money until we kind of know what in the end it's going to cost. So there's no point of spending 30,000 on a study if it requires another study. And then once the study's complete, then it's going to cost so much money to do. So I think referring to staff in a way doesn't kill it. It just keeps it out there on our radar. Like we have done another project and Alder Galvin, would you be okay with that? Just to refer to staff? This is all I'm looking for is to get the process started. If, if we're going to wait for the water to go down, and that's certainly one option, we could be here 10 years from now going, what the hell, okay? And now we've got to start it 10 years later. Once, if we can get the study done, so all I'm asking, start the process to get the study done. And if it looks like, yeah, this is going to be just way too much money for us to do on our own, and there's no other monies available out there through donations. I mean, that East River Trail was built on the back of a lot of private donations, not government dollars. And if we can work with the other communities along there to apply for these state and federal grants for this kind of stuff, we can make it happen. And I'm not advocating question over the other how to get it back open. But um, I, I think get the study done. So let's get the process going to get the study done and if it's not feasible, it's not feasible. But at least we know it'd be embarrassing to sit there and watch and see other communities getting federal and state monies while we're sitting here twiddling our thumbs. You know, and, and then if we think, oh, the, yeah, we could have gotten the money, but well, we didn't do the study. Well, now we got to do the study. Well, now the money's gone. So, I mean, let's, 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 let's just get it going. That's all I'm looking for. How about I make a motion to refer to staff to uh, come up with figures on what a study would cost? I'll second that, but I'd like to ask a question then. Go ahead. I'd like to ask the director if it is feasible to put this on your plate at this time. Yeah, I think we can put together a, a cost estimate uh, for a floodway study. Um, it's tough to put an estimate together for how much it would take to actually repair uh, the situation until you actually know what the floodway studies show and what you're able to do and not do. So you'd be making a lot of guesstimates uh, on what the actual construction cost would be, uh, but we can definitely put together an estimate of what it would cost to, to do the floodway studies and how many floodway studies would we have to do? Uh, can we do just one uh, citywide or do we have to do one floodway study per location where we're having flooding issues? That I don't know, but that's pretty easy to generate an estimate for a study. And would that be in cooperation with the other communities also? That study? It could be. It could be. Um, I guess I would look at doing it uh, for the city of Green Bay ourselves, and we can always uh, coordinate with other communities to search out funding sources uh, through different grant opportunities. But I think each community would probably have to do their own floodway study uh, would be my recommendation. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering then if it also would be wise to reach out to these communities. I mean, if they're not gonna do their uh, studies on their end, uh, we're still kind of we don't have a whole trail then, uh, Alder Galvin? And it, it, this is my frustration. We're siloing ourselves into just Green Bay. We make up a community of municipalities under the, the head of the Brown County government. These trails affect all of these com communities. It's not just the Green Bay Trail. It's the Alloway, Bellevue, De Pere, Ledgeview, and if 
we don't even know if the study could be used, like Dan said, for the whole city of Green Bay. Well, we had to cancel a, a, a CELCOM marathon because the trail flooded on the Fox River. That falls under the state. They give the county money for that trail. You know, so there's, there's some obvious partners here that we should be reaching out to. What if we find out you could do one study for all of Brown County and everyone shares the cost? And we're all solving the problems but the costs are all being shared for everyone. I mean, you know, we, we need to quit just thinking Green Bay, and I understand that's who we represent, but if we can partner with these other communities and solve these problems costing us less money and doing more good, I mean, I'd say, how much money have we put into these trails already to get what we have in Green Bay? Are you just gonna throw that away? That's like having a, a, a building with a leaky roof, but because you don't wanna do the study to see how to fix the roof, how much it's gonna cost, you just let it sit there and rot and go to hell. And, and to me, that makes no sense. We've, we've, how much money did we invest just buying those properties over on, I think it's George Street, and at three corners, to, to say, well, the trails, you know, we're just gonna wait for the water to go down, that might be 20 years. I mean, you know, I mean, so it, it's just, it's frustrating to me, it's frustrating to the people I represent who complain that they're not able to use these, these trails. And I, and I just think we, we need to, as we investigate this, let's reach out to our partners and, and see what we can solve here. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I think, it, I agree. I think it's a great idea to, to reach out to the surrounding communities to find a group uh, solution to this problem. Uh, I guess when I was referring to the floodway study, as I mentioned previously, I believe the purpose of the floodway study is to determine what you do happens you know what happens downstream to the adjacent property owner so i think the real the reality of these floodway studies is there are very um isolated um study uh for a particular problem uh, i don't think it's a regional study floodway study um, but I, i'll definitely look into it and see if there is some sort of a benefit to doing a, a group study with surrounding communities thank you Yep. Okay, Alder Berlack. Just a very naive question. When something like this involves so many different communities, does the city ask the county to take the lead on it? <laughs> we can ask the county and it, and it just depends on whether or not they're running into the same situations where there'd be a benefit on their end to join in on it. So, you know, as Alder Galvin stated, the Fox River Trail is, is, a, is a county, it's actually a state trail, but it's uh, managed by the county. Uh, so, you know, if they're having flooding problems along the Fox River Trail anywhere in the county, it might be something that they'd be interested in partnering with us on. Thank you. But there are other county trails too um, to take into account other than the Fox River Trail. Alder Burnett. Having been on the county board and on the Ed and Rec Committee of the county board that oversees the Parks Department there, I'll say that they have the same question back the other direction. Instead of us doing it, why isn't the municipality started? So as, but, uh, as uh, direct, uh, Alder Galvin said, Supervisor Shu, who is on the county board, kind of initiated the conversation with them. Would, after this direct this discussion, I think Director Ditchay probably understands kind of what the wish is of the committee, or what Alder Galvin's kind of indicated. Um, so I think the motion to refer to staff kind of covers everything. And, and I, think, I don't think we need to amend it. I think Director Ditchay has a pretty good idea of what we're looking for. Yeah. Anyone okay. else? Okay, uh, I believe Alder Burnett made a motion to refer back and did Earl, Alder Gerlach second that? Okay, and then just to uh, costs and possibly a plan and uh, 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 it'd be good to know if um, we're doing this on our own or if we got other partners to go along with it. So, uh, all in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes. You're mute, Randy. Uh, I'm looking for James to give me the thumbs up. Are we ready to go on? 
Sorry. Yep, we're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, item number four, consideration of possible action on the request by Alder Stoyer to look at the layout plan of the Green Bay Metro boat launch to see if there are potential renovations, upgrades to enhance efficiencies of the facility. Also to look, also to take a look at Brown County boat launch facelift, including the potential vacant Eagle's Nest location on Nicolay Drive, as to how they may affect or enhance the Green Bay Metro boat launch locations. Staff, or did you want yeah, to? So, well, Alder Stoyer can start if you'd like. Well, uh, thank you, Chair and Committee. Um, I've been looking at this for some time. Uh, I've been working with a citizen of mine uh, in my my area called Scott. His name is Scott Meverden, and he's here at the meeting as well. So he's a boater, and he'll have a chance to talk. But I think over the last year, year and a half or so, we have uh, looked at the boat launch here. We've looked at other county facilities. You know the efficiencies, the good, the bad, the indifferent what seems to work, what doesn't work. And I'm not a boater myself, I, I, I enjoy it, but I don't boat much. Uh, and others have talked to me quite a bit over some of the things that they feel are deficient or could be improved. So I got together with uh, Director Ditchite on this as well as Scott. Uh, uh, Director Grenier actually met with Scott and I in the springtime at the site and we talked about a number of things. So. With that being said, we took pictures, we've done a number of things. Uh, we put together a map that we gave to Director Ditchite to have his staff put together. Corey Mem worked on it. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dan right now to maybe make that presentation. And, and as time goes on, we can interject our thoughts and uh, ask for your ideas. All right, uh, either Corey or James, I'm wondering if you could pop the map up on the screen so that everyone can see it. And I'll just start uh, talking here. So uh, there does seem to be a little bit of confusion on this facility. Um, hold on a second. Uh, as far as who has ownership, who has, who's responsible for the maintenance and where the funding for improvements come from for this facility. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief summary of all of these issues and then we can discuss the potential improvements uh, that Alder Stoyer has uh, brought up. Uh, so the city of Green Bay leases the Metro Boat Launch property from New Water. Uh, that's the brand of the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewerage District. Uh, we leased it for a dollar per year. Uh, the current lease is a 20 year lease that went into effect in 2011. Uh, the city is responsible for all costs for improvements to the site and all improvements must be reviewed and approved with new water in advance uh, since it is their property. Uh, so the Department of Public Works has jurisdiction on the site features within the waterway. So that includes the launching docks and the shoreline itself. So DPW will install those docks and take them down on a yearly basis. Uh, and then they'll monitor the shoreline as needed. The Parks Department has jurisdiction over and maintains all of the other areas of the site uh, on land. Uh, so that includes the maintenance of the planting areas, the turf, uh, the custodial work relating to the Environmental Education Center from spring to late fall, snow removal and DPW assists with that, uh, parking lot pavement repairs, uh, pay station maintenance, signage, et cetera. So uh, Parks does all of the other maintenance with the exception of the docks and the shoreline. Uh, so new water uh, does maintain the turf area east of the parking lot. Uh, and you can see that on the map, it'd be the area uh, to the right of the parking lot in this map. Uh, so that's our parking lot overflow area. And also new water does the custodial responsibilities for the building from late fall into spring, because uh, they do use that building uh, in the winter months for meetings and they rent it out. Uh, um, the Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute currently is staffing a free to the public watercraft decontamination unit at the site. 
So this power washer unit was funded through a grant through the summer months in 2020 only. Uh, and for now, we have not heard any plans of continuing the service into 2021, but it has been pretty successful. And uh, we hope that they do find grant money to continue that. So then it comes down to fees and how do the fees come in? Uh, so the fees for the annual and daily permits uh, on the site, they're collected from a drop box at a pay station near the docks. Uh, so this money is put into a separate uh, account. Uh, it's a public works account. Uh, so they manage it, uh, that account. And the daily permits uh, can also be paid for using the parking passport app. So the same app that people use to pay the parking meters, they can also pay for a daily permit out uh, at the Metro Boat Launch. Uh, so. Any money collected from annual permits, though, they're, com they're collected countywide, and they're distributed to the communities with launch facilities throughout the county. So about seven years ago was the last study that was completed, and that study kind of determined how that those annual passes um, funding is distributed. So they based it on how many people are using each facility and then divided it accordingly. So right now, Brown County receives 42.6% of the, of the annual uh, fees. Uh, City of Green Bay gets 30%, uh, De Pere gets 25.4%, and the Village of Wrightstown gets 2% of the annual pass fee. So all of this money between the annual fees and the daily passes are put into that one account. And we use all um, funding for this account for maintenance comes out of there. Uh, so for the most part, uh, it pays its own bills from maintenance. So um, DPW charges some expenses to that account every year for getting the docks in and out. Uh, Parks charges that accounts uh, for uh, landscape maintenance and then also, you know, filling um, uh, custodial, um, you know, garbage cans, uh, bath tissues and stuff, filling the building with that. So all of that comes out of that account. And then there is all, there's usually some money left over each year. Uh, over the last few years, we've been accumulating that money. So there's quite a bit in there right now, um, uh, sitting in that account. And uh, what we do is uh, the public works director and I get together and whenever a project comes up, uh, we kind of determine whether or not it's a feasible project to utilize that funding. And if there's enough funding in that uh, account, uh, then we just go up ahead and do that project. If there's not enough funding in that account, what we have to do is uh, put it in our annual bond request and ask for additional funding. So currently the fees are $5 for a daily permit, $35 for an annual permit, $30 for a senior permit, and $60 for a commercial permit. If you recall, a few months ago, uh, we did get approval from Park Committee and City Council to raise those rates. So the new rates are going into effect on January 1st. Um, so now it comes down to what projects or improvements uh, have been determined really need to be done on site. And uh, like Alder Stoyer said, um, there's been a lot of input from the public as far as what the needs are out there. Staff have noticed things that needs to be done also. Uh, a lot of the repairs that need to be done are due to the uh, high water that's out there right now. Um, so here are some of the issues that have been brought up uh, by either staff or members of the public. So we have some shoreline erosion going on. There's sometimes it's difficult to access the launch area due to excessive high water. The service road to the south, which you just can't see on this map, it's just off of this map to the south. Uh, over the last two years, a lot of that service road has been continually underwater due to flooding. So when it comes over the banks, it tends to pool in that area. Um, and then we, we have a payment um, uh, system, which is a sign where people can insert their, their daily payments. Where that's located, it's close to the dock, so it is oftentimes underwater. Now we've, uh, the sign itself isn't underwater, but you have to walk 
through a puddle to get it. Now, what we've done is we've added gravel around it. Uh, that's taken care of the problem for the most part, but it sure would be nice to move that sign. In addition, there's some poor lighting in the launch area. And then um, uh, the parking lot's in need of some repair. So there's some potholes and cracked pavements throughout the parking lot. In addition, there's some circulation problems in the parking lot where people are parking in areas where they shouldn't be. And that's causing, on busy days, that's causing a buildup of parking and just some congestion. So as a staff, we've kind of looked at, well, what can we accomplish in the short term with the funding we have on hand? Uh, so one of the things we'll be looking at is we'll work with the city traffic engineer to look at the circulation patterns uh, that are shown on this uh, proposed improvement plan. So as part of this circulation pattern, what we'd be doing is establishing some no parking areas adjacent to curbs where that are in the travel lanes. We can add signage and then we can possibly remove the service road due to the continual flooding concerns and then create some uh, parking lot islands elsewhere so that the service road would be no longer needed. So we feel that that work can be done in 2021 with the funding that's already uh, currently sitting in our account. Um, and then suggestions for the pay station. Uh, we do agree that the pay station needs to be addressed because you know it is has been underwater a lot of the times over the last two years. Um, one thought is to install an automated pay station. So Brown County is gonna be installing automated pay stations list later on this fall at their facilities. These models run on solar power and a wireless router. The cost of this station is approximately 15,000 and there's a $120 annual maintenance fee per station. So these pay stations print annual and daily permits from the machine directly. Um, we can definitely move the existing sign with minimal cost, so we can do that prior to the start of the 2021 boat season. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at over the winter months here is we'll do a cost analysis to determine whether or not it's feasible to also use some of the existing funding to purchase an automated pay station. Uh, we don't have that answer yet, but we are going to research it over the winter months. Uh, we do feel that the current pay system we there probably are patrons who are not currently paying uh, on busy days uh, we've kind of witnessed that there doesn't seem to be quite as many envelopes in our in our system that there probably should be based on the number of people that are using the facility so we're hoping that this automated pay station would um, help alleviate that concern and then finally, uh, the third project we'd like to address either this fall or next spring would to be to deal with the current erosion issues uh, that are happening near the shelter. So again, those erosion issues are caused for, by the high water right now. Uh, so we really do want to get a handle on those erosion issues. Um, you know, those are kind of the short-term fixes that we're going to be looking at doing over the next six months or so. Uh, but then we do have a, a series of uh, bigger improvements that either, you know, the public have brought up or city staff have noticed that really need to be done. So really the next big project would be the docks. Uh, so currently I believe there's only two docks in place. And the other docks were all damaged uh, due to the high water and they can't be repaired. Uh, there is not enough funding in the existing account to replace all of the docks. So Public Works is currently working on their uh, five-year CIP, and they are going to uh, be requesting funding to replace uh, those docks in the very near future. Um, also, the Parks Department has included the installation of a fishing pier uh, off of this launch in our five-year capital improvement plan as a placeholder to this project. So in our five-year plan that we presented to the um, finance director um, just recently, it's a few years out. Uh, so a lot more research would have to be done over the next few years to determine the feasibility and the proposed cost for this fishing pier. And it likely would have to be funded through a combination of city bond funding and other grants. So it, it wouldn't be a cheap project, but we're hoping to get grants for it. And you know, we're gonna start doing some research on that. Uh, we, we know that that's a hot fishing spot. So if we can do some more improvements to the site, that would be great. 
Um, we have listed other projects long term in our outdoor rec plan that was recently approved by the park committee. And that would be uh, to install a multi use trail from here to Bay Beach, uh, possibly look at land acquisition from New Water, and then do other, some other miscellaneous open shelter improvements and stuff like that. So those are all kind of long term visions that um, we're not necessarily going to seek funding for at this point, but they're good ideas. And if the opportunity comes up, we'll definitely look at those uh, in more detail. And then the final project uh, that the public has brought up is the possibility of adding a breakwater uh, to help eliminate some of the shoreline line erosion and rough water in this area. So to date, I'm not aware of any research that's been done to determine the validity of installing a breakwater in this from a permitting effectiveness or cost perspective. It's just an idea uh, that I recently heard um, that has been thrown out there. But again, if we were to look at that, there's a lot of issues that would have to be uh, looked at with the DNR and Army Corps of Engineers before we would even know if that's a a feasible project. And then finally, um, Alderman Stoyer asked us to look at uh, what Brown County is doing with their launches. So um, in the near future, Brown County will be looking at upgrades to their Bay Shore launch site. Uh, and what they're going to be doing is reconfiguring and raising the great of their breakwater to reduce the amount of wave action. Uh, additionally, they're raising the grade of the parking lot um, to kind of get it out of the, the low areas also. And Brown County finally is working uh, through the process of property acquisition of the Eagle's Nest launch facility. Uh, it might be finalized as soon as October of this year, but uh, I really don't have many details on that. Uh, that's just what I've heard through the grapevine. And eventually that site would be improved as a public launch facility. Um, but again, I don't know how far along they are in the process and, and where they sit with the funding for that. So. Uh, I guess in summary, uh, that's what I have in relation to the history of the site, what short-term fixes we want to do, what long-term fixes are kind of on the horizon, and then what are kind of the, the dream projects to keep in mind if funding comes up. So I guess from here, I'm not real sure what sort of emotion you'd be looking for. Um, but I guess I'd like to open it up for suggestions and comments and questions. Hello? Uh, Alder Stoyer, anything? Yeah, I'll chime in a little bit. And then I, I would like to have uh, Scott Mevert in. Right top, we'd open the floor after. Yeah, we will, we will. But I'm, I'm, he has a lot of uh, insights into this and I, uh, as a boulder, um, I think one of the things I wanted to bring up was the fact that you know, I think um, we're losing money here because of inadequate facilities. The the docks at times are needed are in need of repair. If we had another system where you know maybe aluminum or metal rather than wood, uh, that would work out a lot better. Um, if we had a we know on the map, if you look in the lower right, it says a proposed maintenance shed. You know, we're hoping for maybe a little bigger building where you could actually work on the docks right there and not just store them in the parking lot where they kind of rot during the winter time. I think it would be important to have a facility on site that you could work on these where you could have one, one or maybe only two people move the docks back and forth instead of bringing in a crane to lift and bring that. I think there's efficiencies that we could realize here. Um, I think there's some confusion a little bit between public works and parks as far as who runs what part of it. Um, you know, and I think those are, that needs clarification at times. Uh, I'm a little surprised that the county gets 42.6% here. Granted, you know, I mean, you know, there's facilities throughout the county, but I'm looking at the parks department and DPW is doing a majority of the work here. So I have a I have a hard time understanding why the county gets so much. So you know, you did explain that a little bit, Dan, but I still have questions. Just to clarify, the county. 
just to clarify that the county money is just the season passes. So those season passes are not just sold at the Metro boat launch. Those are sold at the county building, they're sold at De Pere, they're sold at Wrightstown, and then all of that money goes to the county and they distribute it accordingly uh, based on the usership of the site. So it's not, we don't collect all of those, pa all that money uh, for season passes at the Metro Boat launch. Okay, well, that makes sense. But anyway, um, I would entertain uh, you to open the floor so that Mr. Meverden can speak. Um, no, yes, uh, Alder Gerlach. Well, I was going to just um, make that motion for the oh, okay. to open the floor. <laughs> second. Motion by Alder Gerlach to open the floor. Uh, seconded by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the floor is now open. If you would just please state your name and address. I'm Scott Neverton, 1515 Bond Street, Green Bay. Go, go ahead. Uh, first of all, are there any questions for me as a boater of the impossibilities or the possibilities and the impossibilities that we have down at Green Bay Metro Bull Lodge? Well, I, I'm not a boater, so I really wouldn't even know where to begin with that. I'm just going to hope that you any ideas you have, you'll share. <laughs> well, just talk, Scott, just talk about some of the things that we've discovered over time where you think we could be more efficient. Okay. Well, I, we like Mark said that we uh, met with Steve in the uh, springtime about the improvements and the dock repair. Um, the, the parking lot would be an easy fix money wise i wouldn't know exactly offhand but i did work for an asphalt company that we were doing blacktop repair right now there's a lot of holes in there that being avoided from for, from the boaters itself in the parking lot and in the launch zone. Um, the map that you're looking at right now is actually the, Mark gave me the, the picture of it and I made the improvements on here. So if you have any questions about the map, I, feel free to ask. But the, the, we went from five docks down to two. Um, reason being is because from what I understand, we need a crane to lift up the docks because they are solid two by sixes and two by twelves. And the black tanks underneath froze by the time Steve could get the crane down there to get it out. My proposal to Steve was rebuild it as the easiest as possible to put in and remove with minimal one to two people and an eight hour shift. Not a lot of materials. The what? What materials are we talking about? Composite, what, composite decking for the top, like you would have on your on your deck for your house, um, instead of wood, because wood soaks up water, rots out, and causes damage to the docks. That could also cause damage to a person walking out there if the board is either too far rotted or not noticed. I mean, maintenance-free and easy in and out would be the ideal purpose. So either aluminum or aluminum and steel or aluminum or steel and composite deck boarding. 
We have some of that already in some of the other county facilities. If you ever want to take a look at it, it seems pretty efficient. Every one that Brown County owns, De Pere Fairgrounds, Riverside, Wrightstown, and uh, Rivers Bend has uh, docking with Brown County or Howard, but Brown County also maintains that for removal. And the one on the access road by 41, that that <laughs> trick. Every, every one that Brown County has is, is composite decking and, and either aluminum or steel. So, okay. I don't know if anybody else has questions for Scott, but you know, that, that was one of the big things that we saw. And also there were a lot of folks that weren't paying because the water was too high. They couldn't get to the, to the station to pay. So we're, we're losing monies there. Um, anyway, we, we spent like three days, three or four days over time on this. So we have a lot of pictures and different things. I just think that we could be doing better here. Uh, Alder Johnson just called me before the meeting and mentioned that he might be working with somebody on the north end, uh, McDonald's. I don't know if the director did show it, if you heard anything about that. If we could just, if there's any yeah, questions, we got the floor open. That's if there's Go any ahead. questions or any other commentary, otherwise we can close the floor and then we could pick up the discussion for right. ourselves again. Sounds good. Uh, so are there any questions at all or any further comments that you'd like to make? Hi, my name is John Kennedy. Is the floor still open? Uh, the floor is still open. Please state your name and address. John Kennedy, 2773 Newberry Avenue, Green Bay. Um, I've been trying to follow what's happening here. I represent the uh, Green Bay Yacht Club, which is your neighbor right to the south of the map there. And our concern is, uh, and I heard uh, it mentioned that that access road going down to the boat launch right now is underwater most of the time for the last two years, as is our entire north parking lot there and so we've been looking at uh, whether we have any options to uh, raise that parking lot or do something so that we can reclaim it and we know that for us to do that we'd have to get a uh, grading plan approved by the city and when I talked to the city they said well uh, you need you for sure need to pay attention to what the parks department is going to do if anything over there because uh, if we couldn't get approval to do any work there unless um, they knew that it fit into whatever the, the parks were going to do. So I know, I know I heard you mention that the access road might get um, kind of combined there, but is there any intent to raise the grade over there? Because if so, that's something we'd want to know so that we could perhaps dovetail that we might do in our parking lot to match that. We can definitely uh, be in touch with you as we look at our changes to the parking lot and that access drive. So we will make it a point to contact you early on in our uh, planning and coordinate. Well, that'd be great. I appreciate that very much. Sure. Can I, can I just say something else real quick? Certainly. As far as the access road goes, I think it would be a good idea to to invade the drain that is, that sh I, I don't know, I know there is a, a manhole there and there is a drain that's underwater right now. As far as the Yacht Club, I think that we should help them with the grade of that, but that access road, the access road was the old bolt repair area and depending on the size of the boat and the stopping and standing of patron or of just people in general if, they would have to I would say because of the the Parking access road is so far underwater right now. The the buildings that are standing there 
um, have been vacant by the Coast Guard because of the building being in the water. As far as the access road, I say I would say close that off because there's nothing there. There's a a boat repair, but they most of the time people pre, are preparing them in the first aisle of um if you map um they're they're preparing them there so they can make all five if there was five docks there they could make a turn of all five docks <clears throat> anyone else uh, care to speak on this item As we've been talking with Mark, I, the biggest part is the parking lot. It's it's not efficient by any means, and it the different uh, different departments are are taking care of the wrong areas. Could could you explain that a little further, please? I, I'm not sure I understand that. If you look at the north end, or the west end of the dock, uh, you see the docks there. Yeah. EPW is is responsible from the water edge to the parking lot edge. Park and Rec is responsible from the water edge all the way over to the grass area by New Water. Mm -hmm. But if you have a pothole, you would have to call DPW out there to fill the pothole. You would have to call, I, this past summer, I did work for DPW. But I've, I've known a couple of times that people have hit the, or bumped the, the docks down there they would have to call DPW go down there with the bobcat and move the dock into the proper location. Um, DPW is more of taking care of the parking lot, the facilities, everything else that I, I I'm sorry, you're, you're breaking up, or yeah, Scott, you're uh, hesitating. Or <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how to explain it. Is oh. Well, I, I've been explaining it to Mark, so he has. I have some idea. I can I can talk about that a little bit too. Oh. It's like Alder Gerlach has her hand up. How can you see her? I, I can't see anybody. <laughs> Alder Gerlach. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask another naive question. You can always count on me for the night. Is it, is it for anyone? Uh, we um, got the floor open. I, have, so. I know the floor is open, but it's and while the floor is open, I'd like to ask the director okay. to type this. Um, I hear, again, this is so naive on my part. I hear two citizens here who have a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom to share. And I wondered, do our city staff have a system whereby they reach out to these people. I mean, what I'm what I'm saying is these gentlemen are giving all kinds of advice that means nothing to people like me that don't know anything about boats and docks, but I bet they mean a lot to Parks and Rec and DPW. Is there a way that the city staff brings these people into conversations behind the scenes where they can actually advise you know, it seems to me that would be the logical thing to do rather than to try to convince somebody like me what to do with the duck. Yeah, I mean, we, whenever there's a citizen that wants to give input on any project, we give them that opportunity. So we encourage it. 
Uh, we have a design development uh, or a park planner, uh, used to be design development superintendent. Uh, she meets with a lot of residents to talk about projects throughout the parks and what their concerns are and um, you know what development should happen and the reasons why. So uh, we do encourage that. Uh, in this situation, I know as Alderman uh, Stoyer, as mentioned, uh, Mr. Meverden, I hope I pronounced that right, has met with Steve in the past uh, in regards to, uh, you know, suggested improvements here. And I know uh, both the park planner and I have talked to Alderman Stoyer about everything on this map in great detail. And I know he was speaking, uh, he was speaking on behalf of, of Mr. Uh, Meverden. So we have gone through that process for this. But we're always open for more suggestions. I guess my question is, is there a, is there a process where citizens know how they can advise the staff? The process in the past has always just been a case by case. If they, if they would like to, uh, they reach out to us. Uh, that's process in the past. Okay, thanks. Yep. And, and uh, just to, uh, the comment was made about um, uh, the differences between uh, park responsibilities and DBW responsibilities. Do you see any issues there, Dan, from your end? I mean, like uh, when DBW is called to fill the pothole, is that an issue or is, do you see uh, problems? You know, uh, Director Grenier and I uh, do meet regularly uh, to talk through some of these issues and um, you know on a yearly basis uh, we discuss uh, what can be done out here or what needs to be done. Uh, obviously Parks Department does not have the staffing uh, to do a lot of the labor uh, for the patching uh, but some of the patching is is contracted out. So it's not always public works that coordinates that either. Uh, oftentimes they do, especially if it's just patching. Uh, but if it's a larger chunk of asphalt, uh, which you know a few years ago I, I believe that uh, you know we repaved an entire drive uh, at the Metro Boat launch, you know, and that was contracted out. So um, we just. Uh, Director Grenier and I work closely, not just on this. Uh, uh, site, but all of the parks and, and projects throughout the city. Correct. And I'd, I'd add to that, this is really no different than any other park within the park system. So if Director Ditchite were to call up and, and say that uh, there was a reported pothole in a parking lot at any of our city parks, Fisk Park, uh, that needed to be repaired, we would go over and, and complete those repairs because we have the appropriate equipment. So I don't think that there are any any issues uh, between Parks and Recreation and Forestry and DPW as far as being able to effectuate the repairs. Certain departments have certain areas of responsibility <clears throat> and that's a discussion that Director Ditchite and I are gonna continue to have um, because I have some ideas as well on this. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're both here for the same reason. That's to make sure that we're taking care of the taxpayer uh, or the ratepayer here in this case uh, and providing the best experience that we can. So we do communicate almost on a daily basis. Thank you, Director Dish. And I, I do want to add too that it really, from a public standpoint, the, the it doesn't really matter whether they contact public works or parks because they don't know who to contact. As, as Director Grenier mentioned, we, contact, we talk regularly, and so we just review these issues as they come up and the requests come forward. So the public shouldn't see a difference if they call the wrong department. Any comment uh, about the idea of closing off that access road? At this point, I guess I'd want to have more discussions with the city traffic engineer to look at the feasibility of that. I think it's too early to answer that. Okay. Right. Well, uh, any other comments from the public before we close the floor? Or any other questions for someone from the pub for the public from anyone? Motion to close the floor. Motion Second. Close the floor by Alder Burnett. Second by Alder Gerlach. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The floor is now closed. 
Um, for a motion, would it be just to keep referred to staff to the scan all? Yep. Yeah, there's. It's Alder Johnson here. Can I can I say something? Certainly. So, um, so when I saw this come up on the agenda, I reached out to a few people on this particular property, including Chip McDonald uh, with uh, with uh, South Bay over there on the the southern, or excuse me, the the north side of this particular launch. Um, and one of the things I'm not sure. Uh, Director Ditchite, have you had any conversations at all ever like, with them about uh, kind of their operations over there and how it impacts what what we do over here? And, and let, let me be more specific. To some degree, yes. Okay, and, and, and the reason I'm asking that question is because one of the things that Chip brought to my attention is that they currently have in their possession, they've received a $200,000 grant um, that they have matched, so a total of $400,000 that they are investing um, right now to do a study on transient traffic in that area. Part of that is, is a market study and engineering um, to help complete the needs um, to permittable phase. Uh, so basically, what, what he said what a large, large part of that chunk is to determine the wave action, the change of breakwater to accommodate a more safe harbor. So the reason I think this is all relevant, if, and, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, um, Director Grenier, but I know one of the challenges you've had with getting these docks in, especially earlier in the season, is we've got ice shoves that are still coming down the river. We have high water. Um, we just have a lot of complications sometimes that can be occurring because of this boat launch's location. And so I'm wondering if there's a way, rather than us you know, making a decision today or any type of direction for staff you know, to start fixing things or investing money. I think it's prudent for us to at least reach out to, to CHIP to see if there's a way to partner on that grant and if there's a way that we can create a more suitable uh, situation for, for our taxpayers through a collaborative partnership. Um, you know, from what, from what I'm told, and I'm not an expert in this area either, I was told this by multiple people though, that part of the problem that we have again is, is actually the location of the boat launch and, it, and the way that it goes into the river and that perhaps uh, something that's facing north and into the bay might actually be more suitable and allow us to get boats in earlier in the season could potentially be a better long-term investment. So again, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think for us to be a participant, um, at least, uh, not necessarily a participant, but at least having the knowledge of what's happening with this grant would be very valuable for us. So that's all I want to offer up. I, I think it's worth, you know, again, rather than a, a direct action today, I think it's at least worth a conversation um, to see what the outcomes of that, that grant and that study might be. In answer to your question, Alder Johnson, yes, I have been in direct contact with Mr. McDonald for probably the last two months regarding that grant. Uh, they were still waiting to get some feedback from uh, Department of Natural Resources and some other partners with that before uh, before bringing us into the conversation. Okay, so, uh, and, and maybe that's changed a little bit. I, I talked with him, I think it was last week, and I think maybe they're, they're getting possibly to a position now where they can start having that conversation. So I, I think it would be a good idea for us to at least do that. Yeah, I want to uh, refer to staff. I, wasn't, I didn't know that we were going to pick uh, any specific action per se, uh, as far as doing some work. Uh, seems like there's a lot here to still figure out. Um, I do have a, a sort of a related question. Um, the docks are floating docks, so if the river's high, the water's high, we have they can't be put in. Is that is that correct? No, uh, there, there's a lot of confusion about how the docks operate. So essentially, if you go out and look at the facility, there are steel piling in the water that are driven down in the, in the river bottom. Pretty much from those piling out into the river, that facility floats. Then we have a non-floating piece that's like a gangway that connects the floating dock back onto the shore. 
as the water level has come up, not only do the floating docks ride higher in the water than they did previously, changing the angle of that gangway, right. but the water level on the ramp that your, your trailer tires would actually drive down when you're launching or retrieving a boat, mm -hmm. that's come up higher as well, so we need a longer gangway. The reason we're down to two launch facilities is because we've had wave action damage enough sections. There's not enough usable docks left to put all five in, and we've had to rob parts off of the previous locations to make the gangways long enough that people can safely get from dry land out to the floating docks. We simply have only enough parts to have two functional launch uh, facilities. Now, the answer to that, as you've heard from multiple people, is we need to replace the docking systems. Mm -hmm. DPW has concurred with that. We, we've, we've been agreeing to that for a while. Our current estimates place replacement of those docking facilities in the neighborhood of about $400,000. So we are going, we intend to have that as part of our capital program, okay? But again, when we look at capital needs, there's only so much capacity for capital programs. So the council is going to have a challenge in front of you uh, to determine what you're going to fund and what you're not. Right. Right. Uh, this may, perhaps I should put in a different communication. I don't know if it's kind of related, but uh, for the, on the west side, not at this location, at the west side, for with uh, the docking for like uh, those, uh, the, the fishing tournament, um, the, those docks cannot be put in if the water levels are high? At Light Park and at City Deck? Yep. That is correct. So do we need to look at doing something uh, next spring for the fishing tournament to make sure that if the water's high, we can still get the docks in for that tournament? We can definitely explore it, but I can tell you right now it's going to be expensive. Okay. But that should probably be a different communication, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll work on that. All right. Uh, let us get back to this. Business at, at hand. Um, again, um, just a motion to refer to staff uh, pursuing uh, further information and uh, uh, plan. Boulder Worry. Boulder Worry wants to say something. Yeah, and see, I can't see him. I only see well, a few people here. I can't. Everybody. We can. So, can you I'm poking you. Can't you feel that? Poking you. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not poking me in the chest. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, thanks, good. Chairman. Um, Director Ditchade, I was wondering, have we at, at all, uh, during this process or in the past, that you know of, approached any corporate partners to help with this project, to put together kind of a bigger proposal, kind of a grand idea of what we'd like it to look look like no uh the parks department has not approached any corporate partners to see if we can um improve the site that's something you know that we'd be uh, interested in i mean uh, this is kind of a well it is a gateway to our city and you know we really could do something super here i mean we're a water water fairing city <laughs> we should be and the wild the river and the bay are cleanest it's been in a hundred years. I think we're only going to see use of it going up. Uh, it would be nice to see kind of a total cost of what we want to do, maybe by phase, put together a proposal and reach out. And I wouldn't care if we renamed this boat launch, Evan Rood Boat Launch or whatever it is, but um, there's an idea to, to perhaps get some funding, you know. Not that I want to take on another fundraiser. <laughs> oh, no, no, Randy, I see. <laughs> you started this. I know. <laughs> but I'm just floating that idea out there. I mean, I'd be willing to help with it, of course. Uh, so what are we going to do for a motion here? Has any got a, anybody got a motion they'd like to make? I move that we refer this back to staff for further study. That sound about right, Dan? That's fine. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, and, and could we go back to who uh, get the uh, map off the screen? Maybe then I can get everybody, <laughs> I don't know, right now. <laughs> my, 
Thank you. Oh, yeah, there you all are. There we go. That's what did it. Yeah. Uh, motion by Alder Gerlach to refer back to staff. Seconded by, I'm sorry, was that Alder Burnett? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, Alder Burnett, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Back to staff. I think that's been almost every item so far. Uh, are we ready for the next two games? We're ready. Okay. Um, oh, God dang it. Having an old screen problem. Hang on. Uh, consideration with possible action on the request by the Baird Creek Preservation Foundation to begin fundraising to install trailhead signage and art at various locations within the Baird Creek Greenway. Staff? So the Bear Creek Preservation Foundation, uh, uh, Preservation Foundation approached the city and requested approval to begin a fundraising campaign for $72,000 to install new trail signage and artwork and artwork within the Greenway. So the signage would include kiosks, trailhead and arrow markers. In addition to the signage, they'd like to commission with eight artists to create wood or metal art at the start of each of the eight trails. Uh, so there would be no uh, expense to the city for this signage or artwork in this proposal. So all cost costs associated with this project would be paid for from the Bear Creek Preservation Foundation through fundraising. So city staff uh, would work with the foundation to review and approve the final locations and designs for all signage and proposed sculptures. Uh, the art images shown in the attached document uh, that you saw in your agenda packet, uh, those are just examples of the types of artwork that could be installed. Those are not exact, exact uh, replicas of what would be installed. So the group has not hired any artists yet, therefore the final concepts have yet to be presented to the city. So the reason that this is bring, bought, being brought forward now is so that when the group approaches potential donors, they can state that the city council is supportive of this project. Uh, so I think what the group is looking for is a motion to approve the, the Bear Creek Preservation Foundation to begin fundraising to install the trailhead signage, signage and art at various locations within the Greenway. Uh, we do have somebody, uh, Holly is here from the Bear Creek Preservation Foundation. If you'd like to open the floor and ask her specific questions, otherwise we can just move forward. It's up to you. Well, I don't have any questions, but I don't know if she'd like to say anything. Um, yeah, I, if I could, I would like to jump in and- Let, let me open the floor. Uh, Make a motion the floor. to open the floor. Second. Motion by Alder Burnett, second by Alder Gerlach. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the floor is now open. Please state your name and address, and then the floor is yours. Okay, my name is Holly Basin, and address is 1270 East Main Street in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, I am the executive director for the Baird Creek Preservation Foundation, and I just wanted to clarify one, one piece of all that Dan shared. He did a great job. Um, the only piece that I would do want to clarify is that we have gotten approval from the Parks Committee in the past to put in the trail signage already. So that was um, approved, I wanna say, a year and a half ago to do that portion of it. So really all we're asking for is permission to move forward with fundraising for the art aspect um, that would go at the trailheads. Yeah, I do have a question for you with the art. Have you, uh, were you planning on possibly using the uh, Public Arts Commission to send out an RFP, RFP to oh reach a wide range of artists or how are you planning on uh, figuring out what art pieces you want to get or how are you going to uh, market to get artists? Yeah, good question. Um, we have had multiple conversations with them, um, including having them help us put in the concrete bases to have the artists build into. So yes, that has been very much a part of the discussion and will be going forward as well. Excellent. Look, looks great. Fantastic. I'm 100% behind you. I'm sure everybody is. But uh, any other questions or anything for Ms. Baseman? Uh, anything you care to add? That was all I wanted. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion, motion to close the floor. By Alder Burnett. Second. Thank you, Alder Gerlach. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Uh, the floor is now closed. I'll take a motion. 
Um, to approve. Moved it. Moved. Moved to approve by Alder Weary. Seconded by Alder Burnett. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. By all means. Uh, that passes unanimously. And you're on to the next item. Good to go. Uh, consideration with possible action on presentation by the Lower Green Bay and Fox River AOC Biota Committee on several potential wildlife restoration projects located within the city of Green Bay. Staff? So, so the Lower Green Bay and Fox River Area of Concern uh, Biota Committee uh, recently formed. Their task uh, for the committee is to select high priority habitat restoration projects throughout the region that would have the most impact on improving wildlife and natural environments throughout the entire area of concern. So it's not just the city of Green Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, so several projects were selected by the committee within the city limits. The committee is now reaching out to potential partners to get municipality support for these projects so that they can begin searching out grant opportunities. Uh, I am a member of the committee and I did have a part in selecting the projects that we're going to present to you today. Uh, so Brianna from the Wisconsin DNR, uh, she heads up this committee. Uh, she is here and she will give a brief presentation on the reasons why the committee formed, a little history about the area of concern, and then a little bit more uh, detailed information on the proposed project. So I would re recommend opening up the floor uh, to Brianna. So I'll second. I'll second. Um, okay. Question? Or yeah, uh, Chairman Scannell, after the vote, I, I'm going to step away. I will still be in the room present um, oh, just for quorum's sake. So I'm just going to turn my camera off just for a few minutes. Yeah, that you don't have to bother. As long as you're still yeah. present, you're yes. fine. You don't have It's only if you're not going to be present, I need to know. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, motion by Alder Gerlach to open the uh, floor. Second by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the floor is now open. Please state your name and address. And then the floor is yours, Ms. Kupski. Thanks, my name is Bree Kupski. My address is 3915 White Pine Drive, Green Bay, um, 54313. And I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And hopefully, so you can move this big thing out of the way here. All right. Um, well, thanks for letting me participate and take up a little bit of time on your agenda this evening. Um, thanks, Dan, for the introduction. Um, so as Dan said, um, I'm an Area of Concern Coordinator at the Wisconsin DNR, um, and what I do is help coordinate um, restoration or remediation projects in the Great Lakes. Um, so my focus is on the Lower Green Bay and Fox River, as well as the Lower Menominee River. Um, so just some context on the Area of Concern program. Um, there are 43 areas of concern that were um, identified throughout the entire Great Lakes region. 31 of them are located in the US. Um, and what really characterizes these areas is that they're often um, pretty industrialized and urbanized harbors where there's been some kind of really significant um, sediment contamination. And that poses you know, risks to you know, human, health, human health as well as impacts to fish and wildlife, as I'm sure you all are aware. Um, so because they pose so much of a risk, um, they're often prioritized for remediation and restoration efforts. Um, in Wisconsin, we have five areas of concern that were originally designated. Um, the Lord actually just had that designation removed. You might have seen that in the news um, because we completed all the work there um, to get it out of that sort of severely degraded category. So that was a really important and exciting milestone for our state. Um, so in this area, you'll see this map on the right mm -hmm. here, um, the red boundaries um, delineate where the area of concern um, is considered to be. So seven miles below dam and then a 21 square mile area of the Bay of Green Bay. Um, and why was it um, chosen as an area of concern or designated? Um, it really comes down to three major issues. Um, we have really degraded water quality or had um, for the better part of the century. You know, the Fox River was named one of the 10 most polluted rivers um, in the country by the federal government um, back in the early 1900s. Um, and then, you know, we obviously had a major contaminated sediment problem and then um, loss of fish and wildlife habitat. So um, we've made a lot of progress in a lot of areas um, as far as improving water quality. I think we all know that's a pretty major work in progress to see this picture 
for the metro boat launch of the, um, these harmful algal blooms, which um, you'll see often sort of towards you know, late July into August. Um, and obviously we know, you know, a lot of what's causing that is, you know, stormwater runoff from the watershed from agricultural fields and um, urban areas and that sort of thing. Um, so we're just one of many partners that are working hard um, with, you know, agricultural producers and communities to try to figure out ways of reducing the stormwater runoff and improving water quality overall. And just because you guys had kind of talked about this um, earlier in the meeting, um, we actually do have some projects that we're looking to implement to help with flooding um, and the associated issues that flooding presents. So um, I think that if there are questions about, you know, state or federal grants that can help with um, some of the flooding and water quality issues, um, feel free to give me a call or an email to talk more about that. Um, obviously, we just uh, finished the Fox River cleanup project um, in June of this year. I uh, just want to highlight a couple of fun facts out of that. Um, 8.2 million cubic yards of contaminated sediment were remediated, um, not removed as my PowerPoint slide inaccurately <laughs> claims. Um, just a little fun fact on that. If you were actually line up, you know, like all of the sediment that was taken out via dump trucks, it would span from the city of Green Bay all the way to London, England. So a lot of sediment taken out of the river. Um, paid for by the responsible parties. And then, you know, we had a very large and diverse and talented workforce um, that was on site daily for, you know, over 10 years. So we lived, worked and played here, brought in, um, you know, a lot of money to enhance our local economy over that time. And then the last thing that um, we're working on is improving fish and wildlife habitat, which is really why I'm here to talk to you tonight. So as Dan said, you know, we've been talking with a lot of fish and wildlife experts, um, local city staff, um, um, municipality staff, excuse me, um, as well as community members to come up with um, ideas for different projects. And so we've got a list of 18 potential projects that as Dan said, he's been involved with helping choose. Um, the ones here in the red box are the ones that are um, either on the city of Green Bay um, property or sort of directly adjacent to city of Green Bay pro uh, property. So I just wanted to kind of touch base on all of those um, real quick. Uh, the first one is I guess I'll pause here for one second. I don't know if I'm supposed to just keep going or uh, let people ask questions sort of in between. Either way, just keep going. Good, okay. <laughs> so the first project area that I'm gonna talk with you about um, is this area called, um, lovingly referred to as this um, tank farm marsh, which is, if you can see my cursor, kind of just right in this area. You'll see this panel on the left is just um, showing aerial imagery from 1938 all the way up to 2017. So, you know, you can see that over the last several decades, you know, what used to be a very extensive um, and one of the most important coastal wetlands um, in all of Lake Michigan um, has been, you know, filled and um, heavily industrialized. Um, and this area used to be, you know, just very critical habitat and actually still um, does act as um, or serve as critical habitat, um, but there's a lot of improvements that could be made to it um, for several different endangered species um, just by doing some kind of small and easy things. Um, so I just want to kind of touch base on a couple of those. Here's just some pictures I took of the area. Um, I wasn't sure how um, familiar people would be with them, but um, yeah. So some of the stuff that we're, some of the things that we're um, proposing to do here is um, better water level management um, through all of the industrialization in this area. One of the things that seems to have happened is that um, where this area used to be cut off from the bay and served as sort of a refuge during these really high water times um, where a lot of the vegetation gets knocked back, which is really hard on the fish and wildlife that use it, um, you know, this area wasn't connected to the bay so well. And so it didn't fluctuate with the bay levels as much. Um, so what we would like to do here is kind of take a look at where that connection is happening, you know, if there's a way to sort of cut it off a little bit so that this serves more of that sort of refuge um, for different fish and wildlife or look at sort of water level management so that we can keep that vegetation in there um, and help out, you know, all the different species that need it. Um, improving wetland habitat, obviously, this is pretty loaded up with a lot of invasive species. So um, we could do some simple things there to make that better. Um, some ideas for encouraging some rookery habitat, um, floating nest platforms, and then just, you know, uh, wood and stuff like that for um, turtles and frogs and fish. And I'll just mention, um, uh, this is not necessarily an area of the city that um, many people are familiar with, you know, a lot of people recreating around necessarily, but, um, you know, for bird watchers and things like that, this is actually a very heavily utilized place. And 
one that people from out of town will come to very frequently to come and check out the birds that frequent this area. Um, the second project that I want to talk to you about is um, at Dutchman Creek, which is just adjacent to the Railroad Museum, um, which is on City of Green Bay par property. So most of the work there that we'd be talking about um, looking into doing is promoting habitat for um, sunfish, um, catfish, and native mussels. Um, so, you know, putting little cobble and stone into the um, creek bed, nothing that's really going to impact navigation or anything like that. Um, and then doing some woody habitat and aquatic vegetation improvements. Um, and then anything along the actual um, land portion of that along the uh, railroad museum property would be, you know, looking at stabilizing any bank erosion that's happening um, as needed and then just sort of the, um, improving vegetation on the actual um, land-based property. The third project is at Bay Beach Wildlife Sanctuary. So this would be a pretty large project. Um, we'd be really looking at trying to get after all those invasive species um, that are present there, trying to um, install some more native plants. Um, you know, there's a lot of areas that are sort of grassy, kind of um, a little bit lower quality habitat that could be um, transitioned into something that uh, sort of serves as more of a prairie and is um, more beneficial for uh, wildlife specifically. Another thing that Dan and I have talked about um, a little bit is naturalizing the shoreline of the lagoon area. Um, so uh, the lagoon area is pretty um, heavily rip wrapped as you can see in here. Um, you know, and there's not you know a lot of wave action as you'd experience like on the bay or something like that. So um, that's something that would be um, of interest in looking into how you could make that um, you know more vegetated. <clears throat> and then uh, we've also talked about doing some sort of um, prairie or rain garden plantings, you know, sort of where appropriate. You can see there's a lot of bare turf grass um, that the geese really like. You know, if you can get something established that has a lot more vegetation that maybe they don't want to mow down so much, you can kind of decrease some of those geese hanging out in there um, in the entirety of that space. Um, this is just a little quote that we got from, or a quote, not a little quote, but a quote that we got from somebody in a survey that we sent out. Um, where they said, you know, this is a really big attraction area, um, interest spans age groups, demographics, um, probably reaching more than many projects. So um, when we sort of looked at this project uh, compared to some other ones uh, that we're looking at, this one was one of the highest rated um, by community members. Uh, the fourth one is at Ken Yours. So um, we'd be looking at doing work that's very similar to the work that was already done um, on the East cell through the partnership with Exxon Limited and UW Green Bay. Um, so just removing invasive species and better water level management. And then the last project would be at Joliet Park. Um, majority of that would be in water, um, looking at trying to establish these sort of um, cobbly or boulder bouldery um, uh, fish spawning reefs, so a lot for um, specifically targeted at walleye and um, smallmouth bass, and then maybe improving that um, existing walleye spawning reef that's there, and then just some um, improvements to the vegetation along the shoreline. Um, so that's pretty much all the projects that we're talking about um, that are actually located on Green Bay um, property, or City of Green Bay property. Um, the way that we get this funded is that um, the DNR um, works with EPA to attain um, non-competitive funds to um, plan and design projects um, through one grant. And then once we sort of all agree that, you know, the project is doing what it needs to do, um, we would go back and um, apply for implementation funding. Um, so I will be working with uh, many different project partners and submitting project proposals um, this December for a subset of the 18 um, potential projects. Uh, the Tank Farm Marsh and Dutchman Creek are the highest priority um, for this year, so we would start there, but then we would be submitting for the rest of them um, sort of mid to late next year as well. And that's just for planning and design funding. Um, in that time, we're also gonna be soliciting contributions from other funding sources. Um, and often the way that this works is that the DNR passes these funds through to the local unit of government to actually administer the project. You know, it's not really appropriate for me to administer, you know, a project um, at Bay Beach as much as it is for somebody like Dan. Um, and I just kind of threw a couple of slides in here of um, how, you know, these projects have been done in other areas of concern. So this was in Lower Menominee or in Marinette. Um, if you ever go up there, um, Menakani Harbor was, you know, you'll see a picture here of what it used to look like. It was, you know, just very um, super degraded, not good navigability. Um, and now it looks like this. Um, the year that it was, um, the year after I believe that it was open, 
they were able to host, you know, a national walleye fishing tournament that was able to bring in around a million dollars just in one weekend. So a lot of um, economic and social benefits as a result of that project. Um, Sheboygan is another place where we've done a lot of this work already. Um, if anybody knows anything about, you know, sort of the harbor area, it's been very, very much um, lots of commercial development, new housing, um, about $70 million worth of investment recently um, in this area. So a lot of good economic growth there too. So um, that's pretty much what I have um, to present to you guys tonight. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. I don't know if there are any questions specifically, but I think that what we're hoping to um, do is just, you know, introduce the uh, project ideas to the committee um, and to get some sort of acknowledgement that it's okay for, you know, um, Dan and Steve and I to work together to just really try to go out and get that planning and design funding, knowing that um, the reason we'd be doing that is to really implement these projects down the road. Yeah, I, I think it sounds fantastic. And, uh, but I'm, uh, maybe I'm getting it confused with uh, the presentation the other day with the Clean Bay backers, but wasn't there something with Ken Ewers in this packet too, I thought, or am I getting it mixed up with something else? Ken Ewers Park, was that, was that included at all in? Yep. Ken, so I'm not sure what, um, so Ken Ewers is included as one of the projects that we'd be searching for funding to do uh, right. to continue that work there through my program. Right, right. And, and is Ducks Unlimited involved at all? Are they helping out with funding and so on? Yep, they would be um, directly, um, they have been directly involved um, with us as part of our committee, um, as is UW-Green Bay. Um, the, you know, we wouldn't look um, at the state level to pass through um, funding directly from EPA to Ducks Unlimited because it's non-competitive um, and they are a nonprofit. So it really doesn't, we'd have to go through a lot of procurement hoops to make that sort of jump happen. So it'd make more sense for the city <laughs> to take that on but in partnership with Ducks Unlimited. Yeah. Okay, thanks, that's it for me. Any questions from anyone else? Uh, I did just want to clarify the Dutchman Creek one uh, because as you know, or many of you may know, maybe you don't, uh, but that is in Ashwaubenon, uh, but the city of Green Bay actually owns the land adjacent to this project and that is where the National Railroad Museum is located and they lease the property from the city of Green Bay. So that's why we discussed that one tonight. I'd just like to say this sounds so fantastic. I would like to close the floor and move to approve this. Motion to close the floor by Alder Garlack. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alder Weary. All in favor? I think I, if uh, Elder Scannell, I think uh, Director Grenier had his hand up. I don't know if he had a oh, comment or question. I'm sorry. Uh, Director Grenier? Oh, go ahead and close the floor. Okay, yep, okay. Uh, all in favor of closing the floor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the floor is now closed. Uh, Director Grenier? Uh, again, j just a, a little housekeeping issue and, and thinking of Bree more than anybody. Uh, we have a similar item that we're going to be discussing on the Improvement Service Committee meeting, and she gave you the presentation that she would otherwise be be giving at INS. So what we're looking at, the, the Dutchman Creek falls under the Parks jurisdiction, so Parks Committee would have to take action. The tank farm is property owned by the city, which then becomes jurisdiction of Department of Public Works, so it has to go through INS. So I would think that whatever action you're going to take here at Parks regarding this issue, we would take a similar action at INS. And if that's the case with the pleasure of the committee, after we're done here, you could release Bree and she doesn't have to sit around for the INS meeting as well. So I just wanted to bring that up quickly. Okay. I was hoping we get the presentation backwards in INS. Uh, I've given it a lot. <laughs> uh, I do have okay. a I do have a proposed motion, uh, which would satisfy what Bree is looking for. So it'd be to authorize staff to apply for grants to support the Lower Green Bay and Fox River AOC committee and several potential wildlife restoration projects located within the city of Green Bay and to approve the city becoming project partners on the projects presented. 
Someone want to make that motion? Moved. So moved by Alder Gerlach. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alder Brunette. Uh, is there any need for any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Ms. Kupski, you did a great job. Yeah, thanks. And, and, Talk to uh, you all soon. We won't need you for INS either. We've got it all covered. Thank you. Have a great night. And are we on to the next item, Jane? We are, okay. Um, consideration was possible. Oh, God dang it. Sorry, screen went away on me. Uh, consideration with possible action on approving the city to enter into a trail easement with the Brogan Family Trust for the relocation of the Fox River Trail on parcel 15-168-B on the 700 block of South Adams Street. Staff? So the city uh, approved a residential development on the east side of the Fox River immediately south of Mason Street. If you recall, there used to be a white warehouse on that site. Uh, the warehouse was removed and the developer has begun grading work uh, on the associated project. So as part of the developer's agreement, they are required to relocate the existing Fox River Trail from Cass Street to Mason Street. Up until recently, this trail followed Adams Street. Uh, the contractor has already removed the trail and they have been gun work uh, relocating along the river's edge. The gravel base is installed and the paving is tentatively scheduled for mid-October. Um, the developer is able to install the new trail completely on their own property, uh, but it would create two sharp turns in the trail, which would cause an unsafe condition for bikers. So therefore we contacted, the city contacted the Brogan property, which is the adjacent property owner to the south. Um, we asked if they'd be acceptable to the city placing the trail partially on their property. This would be, allow for a much smoother transition for the trail curves. Uh, the Brogan family is agreeable to the proposed easement. I have the easement uh, attached to the agenda packet. If you have any questions on that, uh, the city would pay $10 for this permanent easement. And there is language in the easement that if the Brogan family ever wants to develop the parcel, uh, they could work with the city to relocate the trail from Adams Street to the river's edge, similar to what the existing developer to the north is doing. Uh, and then just so you know, the developer to the north is responsible for all construction construction costs associated with installing the trail on the Brogan family property. Uh, so I would recommend a, a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion, motion to approve. Motion to approve by Alder Wittery, seconded by Alder Burnett. Uh, all in favor? Oh, uh, Alder Burnett. Well, I just, a quick, quick comment sure. that Director Didshai, we don't always, you know, say this as much, but great job. To, to do this and to do it for only $10, it's a, quite an accomplishment. So good work to you and your staff. Thank you very much. Yep. I was hoping for nine ninety nine, but. I was hoping a little lower, but I'll settle <laughs> for the 10. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye, opposed. Okay, that passes unanimously. And on to the next item. Um, consideration with possible action on approving a 17,940 contract amendment with Berners Schrober for the City Hall Mechanical Replacement Engineering staff. So in 2020, bond request funding was set aside to hire an engineering consultant to develop the construction plans, specifications, and cost estimates to replace the mechanical systems at City Hall. The city recently sent out a request for proposals for this, week, for this work, and it was determined that the scope of work was too vague uh, for the various firms to put together competitive quotes. So there are several types of mechanical systems that could be installed, and each type has their advantages and disadvantages. Each firm, when they submitted their pro proposal, they had to make an assumption as to which system was most appropriate, and then which uh, design work uh, would have to be done to accommodate that system. So it was really hard to compare apples to apples. 
So therefore, the city decided to hire Berner Schilber for $9,000 to create a preliminary analysis to select the final equipment to better define the scope of work for the RFP we will resubmit. Uh, so once this report is complete, we'll have a recommendation from the engineer as far as which type of system is most appropriate for City Hall. Uh, we'll then issue another request for a proposal to hire an engineering firm to create construction documents based on the recommendation by Berner Schober's preliminary engineering study. So after work has be began on this preliminary analysis for $9,000, uh, Berner Schober has proposed that we add an energy modeling to the various proposed mechanical systems to the scope of their work as part of the preliminary analysis. So this mod modeling would be done by a subconsultant and would show the energy savings and costs associated for the various proposed mechanical um, revisions. So this energy analysis analysis for each method will help the city determine which option we should select in the end. Um, so we can narrow it down taking into account installation costs versus energy savings. So the study will have to be done either as part of the preliminary study or as part of the final engineering study. So staff is recommending that it makes the most sense to include it in the preliminary study. That way there'll be fewer assumptions to make when the request for proposals are sent out for the final engineering. So the cost for the proposed work is $17,940 in addition to uh, what we're under contract to pay them for the preliminary study. So we're looking for approval uh, of a $17,940 contract amendment with Berner Schober's for the preliminary study. Uh, comments or a motion? Alder Gerlach? Question, my typical question, where's the money coming from? So as I mentioned, we bonded for this engineering in 2020. Mm -hmm. So it's coming out of a, a bond request that we already have the money in hand. Okay, thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Is there a motion? Move to approve. Move to approve by Alder Burnett. Second. Second by Alder Gerlach. Any discussion at all? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. On to, on to number nine. Consideration with possible action on amending general ordinance number 36-20, sections 25.04, subsection 1, and subsections 11 of the Green Bay Municipal Code relating to park hours, modifying the daily park hours from 6 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. from 6.30, from 6 to 10.30 p.m. to 6 to 10 p.m. I think I said that right, finally. Yeah. Uh, Staff, just anything uh, you care to Yeah, add? so cur currently the parks are open from 6 to 10.30, as you mentioned. Uh, the police department has requested that we modify our park hours to be consistent with the curfew for minors under the age of 17. So the curfew for minors is 10 to 6. Uh, that way there's no confusion if it ever becomes necessary to remove a minor from the park between 10 and 10.30 p.m. So as a park staff, we really have no concerns with this request as there's rarely any events in the parks that would extend beyond 10 p.m. So in order to modify the park hours, the park committee and city council would have to approve this ordinance change. We've included the language in the agenda packet. So the modifications to the two, re to the two related ordinances are spelled out in detail. So section 45.041 would need to be amended to modify the hours when the public is allowed to park a vehicle in the park. And then section 25.0411 would need to be amended to modify the actual hours the park is open to the public. Um, both sections have, do have a statement that the park hours can be modified as needed for a city-sponsored or approved 
activity. So if for some reason there is uh, an event after 10 o'clock, uh, as long as I approve it, uh, we can extend the hours past 10. Alder Burnett. Uh, Director Ditchhead, are any of our shelters for rented, rent, rented shelters for events open until 10 or 10.30? What, what's the cutoff if someone rents a shelter? Uh, this year, we, we made the hours earlier. I can't remember exactly. I'm thinking it was about 7 o'clock. We ended it this summer due to COVID. Uh, but normally, they extend to, uh, I believe, 8 or 9. Um, so we would have to look at that. But it, it doesn't go past 10 o'clock. So and, and the, the reason I say that is if someone rents a shelter and they'll say 9, if that's our normal time, maybe they have to clean up, you know, to maybe – it takes them a good hour or so to clean up after their event and uh, just be mindful of that. I, I'm, I'm in agreement with the police, it makes sense, but just be aware that there might be situations if a person rents a shelter, they may need that time to clean up and get their guests out of there in time. If I may, I, I, I uh, spoke with a number of the officers about this. I, I talked to Dan about putting this on the, our agenda uh, and they are well aware that, you know, they're not out to, harass people you know if if like there's a ball game going that goes a little later and they're they just needed to be able to take care of they've run into some situations yeah. especially some of the parks where we've had some trouble uh navarino and seymour and everything that it would really be useful to have the park hours the same as as yeah. the curfew hours Makes so we're not sense. really looking to you know create waves or anything with any mm -hmm. activities that are Okay. Bonafide and legitimate. So, all right, move to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Alder Brunette, seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. And then we're just on to the informational. Does anybody have any questions or comments for the director? Again, a wonderful, excellent <clears throat> report. Thank I'll you. Have one quick comment, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. Yep. Thanks. Um, Dan, I just, I, I mean, we probably talked about this already at a past meeting, but since it's an official report here under aquatics, great job with Coburn this year for the, you know, with COVID going on and grand opening and kind of limited hours and limited staff and, the, you know, for the numbers that we did and the revenue, um, that was so good to see. And uh, hopefully we can have a normal year next year. But well done to you and Ann and everybody who involved. Yeah, and kudos to our staff on that, because um, Ann did a great job uh, pulling that all together. Alder Burnett? Yeah, so Dan, this probably falls under activities of the Parks Department. Regarding the the um, park downtown, right across from St. John's, you had indicated that the bathrooms are closed due to COVID, but we have yes. porta potties. Uh, just trying yes. to logically make sense of that. Why are we putting porta potties when maybe restroom would probably be better? Uh, the porta potties uh, are cleaned uh, by the professional company uh, that we rent those from. So they clean them several times a week. Uh, and we do pay them for that service. Uh, but that is what we've done in, in a lot of our parks uh, this summer uh, as we went that route uh, versus opening up the restrooms. And I believe that was spelled out in our uh, COVID opening plan as far as the reasons why. So be happy to answer specific questions in regards to that if you have any, but. Uh, just for me, I mean, if it's gotta get clean, whether it's a park uh, bathroom or a porta potty, it, to me, it's kind of the same, I, I would imagine it takes. <laughs> so I'd rather the, for the guests, for the, for the comfort of the people who unfortunately are homeless, would it, it would probably to me make more sense to have them be able to use the restroom facility the difference the difference is contracting out the services versus our own uh, park staff doing the cleaning can we contract the same company to clean the restroom rather than a porta body we, we did reach out to uh several different uh cleaning companies for st john's in particular because we are having an issue there uh they all declined to uh provide a quote for it because they are very busy right now uh due to having a lot of contracts out there for covid cleaning uh that they can't take on additional work so we reached out we could not find a company that would quote on that work 
Yeah, thank you. I'm not criticizing the decision. It just didn't really make yeah. sense. That's all. Thank you. Yep. Alder Gerlach? Wouldn't, if if you use the um, park restrooms, wouldn't we all, wouldn't we go right back to the problem of who's going to open them and who's going to close them? I mean, isn't that why you use it? Well, part of the reason why you're using porta potties, it, otherwise we have to go all the way back to that issue again, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I'm not criticizing. It just did logically mm -hmm. make sense, but he explained it. So thank you. Anything else? Motion to receive and place on file. Motion to receive and place on file by Alder Weary. Second. Second by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have received that and placed on file. Our next meeting is October 14th, 2020. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn it. So moved. Second. second. Okay, a motion by Alder Burnett, <laughs> second by Alder Gerlach. And just for information, oh. Mr. Chairman, we take a 10 minute break. 7.25 is when INS will start. Seven, oh, that's excellent. I was going to say- 7.25, yep. That's, that's okay, a little- to Take care of whatever business. Yep, yep, <laughs> thank you, sir. That's excellent. Uh, okay, so uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, staff. Excellent. Thanks, thank sir. you, Dan. And uh, we'll see everybody in about 14 minutes. Thanks to staff.